sponsors of the event with St. A's, uh, the Institute of Politics. Uh, this is the second time we're back at DVI. This week we had uh, Congressman Peter Lint, uh, King uh, speak this past uh, week and it was a terrific event and uh, lots of positive feedback from that. And now we're back here again to hear from one of the political gurus of the of the nation here. And uh, before I introduce Neil to introduce our keynote uh, guest speaker here this morning, again, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge all of the wonderful banners of the companies that are uh, generous in supporting <coughs> politics and eggs and putting on the, uh, the breakfast series here that we're able to provide for all of you at no cost. Uh, and it's because of all these wonderful, wonderful members. Not only are they good corporate uh, neighbors here in New Hampshire. They've been very, very good supporters of the New England Council. We just want to thank them all. But if you see them, also thank them for this great series that we're able to provide. So with this, uh, as I said, we do this with the Institute of Politics at the St. A's, and we couldn't have a better uh, partner. Uh, they do an outstanding, outstanding job, and they get top-notch speakers to, uh, to attend all of their forums and seminars throughout the years, and uh, it says an awful lot about the Institute and how well known they are and how well respected they are. And uh, Neil Levesque, who does a fabulous job there in promoting the, the Institute, is, is somebody that uh, we work with on a daily basis and we couldn't have a better partner. So for purposes of introducing our, our guest speaker here this morning, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Neil Levesque. That was a long pause before the applause. I just. <laughs> well, with us this morning uh, is longtime national political consultant and current contributor to CNN's best political team on television, Alex Castellanos. Alex has been consulting in the political and private sectors for nearly four decades. He has worked uh, two dozen for two dozen U.S. senators, governors, and presidential candidates. He is co-founder of Purple Strategies, a national bipartisan public affairs firm, and most recently he founded the organization The New Republican. The New Republican is dedicated to advancing conservative principles in the current communications age of political campaigns. Um, today he's going to discuss this endeavor. Um, I also want to point out before he comes up that he was born in Havana. Um, as Pat Griffin mentioned last night, if you were at the Institute, uh, his family came over with uh, $11. So he's certainly um, uh, a fine example of the American dream. Um, and we're pleased to have you here. This is New Hampshire's premier presidential breakfast series. So we're glad to have you here, Alex. Treat, uh, treat to be here. Yes, we came here in 1961. My parents had uh, one suitcase, two kids, $11 in Havana, Cuba. And uh, now, thanks to the recent unpleasantness uh, in the economy, we're up to about $12 now. <laughs> we're, uh, it's great to be back up here. and. Uh, New Hampshire where it always begins. Uh, I remember my first presidential campaign up here uh, where I met Pat Griffin to the Irish talk is a dance. <laughs> That's Pat Griffin. Uh, never had so much fun, never scared. Came up here with Mike Murphy, Pat Griffin to do 41 to shoot uh, man on the street commercials for George H.W. Uh, Bush. If you will recall, he was not uh, entirely well loved by 100 percent of the electorate at that point. Um, and we were chasing people down the streets with cameras. Would you please, please say something nice about the President of the United States? And they'd say, no. Many gave us a one-fingered salute. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, we sent film back to the headquarters in D.C., film of people running away from us, voters running away. 
Little did I know that would set the pattern for the rest of my political career, voters running away from my candidates. But, uh, but that's how it began up here in New Hampshire. Uh, my name is Alejandro Castellanos, and uh, you can tell from that I'm one of a, a member of one of America's most beleaguered minorities here. I am a Republican. <laughs> And uh, there are a few of us left in Washington, D.C. Um, and I do actually spend a lot of time on CNN as part of the best political team that calls itself the best political team on that. Uh, you can see how accurate CNN is on everything else just from that. But uh, I was... Uh, I was in an airport not too long ago, and this lady walks up and says, You! You? You were in my bedroom the other night. I turned to my wife and said, Honey, it's not what you think. Um, but it's fun. You, you know, you get to know folks because you have spent time in them. And folks are so open anywhere you go and chat with you. And these are interesting times to talk about. And I want to talk a little bit about... Uh, more folks fleeing the Republican Party, just like uh, when we started here years ago. Where the Republican Party is, is there a future for it? It seems that the discussion these days is, um, and I'm going to put up my little clock up here so that I can hold this to just four hours. <laughs> it seems that the, we're having a great discussion now about the future of the Republican Party and whether they have one. Uh, a lot of the discussion is what to write on their tombstone. And there are causes for that. You know, we have somehow managed to become the pro-rape, anti-sex party, which you would think is difficult. We are the party that uh, seems to be pushing America toward the edge of an economic crisis. We're um, a party divided in many respects. Our favorable, unfavorable rating, our unfavorable rating is 60 percent, but that was last week. We seem to be working very hard to get it higher, and our brand is a ball and chain around the leg of every candidate and every policy and every idea that has the word Republican attached to it. How did we get there? Uh, hard work and discipline <laughs> is part of it. What was the difference between 2010 and 2012? I mean, other than we did slightly better one year than the other. 2010, Democrats controlled everything. They controlled the House, the Senate, and the White House. Three accelerators on the car. America looked at Washington and said, oh my God, what are those people doing out there? And the answer is, anything they want. Obamacare, 3,000 page health care bill, seemed to emerge on the national scene overnight. Congress would take 100 pages out of it one night, put in 300 pages the next morning. We're going to spend a trillion dollars to save money. And we all know how good Washington is at that. Scared the American people. Most Americans wanted some kind of health care reform. By that, they meant make it cost less. But at some point, the debate turned from a debate about health care to a debate about government out of control. Three accelerators on the car, no brake pedal. And America looked at those Republicans over there on the sidelines and says, you know, those guys are not good for much, but they seem to be pretty good at saying no. And so they tap the brake pedal. That's us. That's our party. Party of no. America trusted us in that moment to say no. And then came 2012. 2012, we just put a brake pedal on the car. Didn't need a second one. 2012 was a leadership election. Our economy's in the ditch. Our country is concerned about where it's going lift our eyes over the horizon, take us to a better place. And the country did not trust Republicans one inch beyond no. 
because we haven't made that case. That was an election, that, at least from the Republican point of view, a wounded president, a struggling economy, a s smaller percentage of Americans in the workforce than we've ever seen. We spent a billion dollars to lose an election we should have won. We could have lost that election for only half a billion. <laughs> Saved a lot of money. Why is that? I'll draw you a map, if you'll indulge me here, my, my only artistic presentation of, of the day here. And I'll, I'll just speak up and hope we can hear you. But um, why we are where we are and the path forward. Um, can everyone see the canvas? <laughs> OK. I'm graphically impaired. Be gentle. Okay, this is Alex's map of America, something I think I learned of doing this for about 40 years. Everybody ready here? Here we go. <laughs> okay. Um, the bell curve, standard statistical distribution, or a hump. Why is this a map of America? This is going to be reputation. This is going to be time. Why is this a map of America? Because it's an arrow there. America has always thought itself ascendant. We have always thought ourselves on the way to somewhere better. We have always thought our kids would have more opportunity than we would. That if we worked hard, if we played by the rules, somehow we would achieve something that those before us have. Call it the American dream, call it optimism, call it vision, something fundamental to the core of the American people. There's a French researcher named Clotaire Rappé who helped design the Jeep Cherokee, and he made the headlights round. You know what? He said he came over here and said, these Americans are strange people. They are restless people. <coughs> They're not happy sitting still. Huge country, vast networks of roads. Americans are always going somewhere. He made the headlights round because they're the eyes of a horse. That's what the Jeep Cherokee is. And they have sold zillions of those things to this restless country that is always on its way to what's next. So this is who we have been. The frontier is still in us, until right about now. Ask any pollster and they'll tell you. More Americans think our best days are behind us, not ahead. More Americans think our kids will have less opportunity, not more. Now, Americans do not think we have declined. Survey research doesn't tell us that. But we're over the hump on the roller coaster and we can see it. And it makes us anxious and it makes us concerned. What is the rational response when you think you're in that moment? When you think decline is ahead of you, when you think you're losing? Help. Stop. Security. Right? Protect me. Health care security, employment security, retirement security. Protect me from the dreaded 32-ounce soda. <laughs> the nanny state, right? This is the Democrat campaign for leadership in America. Security amidst decline. What's the Republican campaign? No, it won't work. It'll accelerate decline. It'll make it worse. You can't spend your way out of overspending. No, don't touch the hot stove. Among many other things I have been called, I've been called the father of the attack ad. Uh, another, that's, some of the, that's one of the nicer ones. <laughs> uh, I love negatives. I think negatives are great. I think there are times you say, hey, you yell fire in the crowded theater because it's on fire. 
don't touch the hot stove is important, but occasionally people want to eat. You got to cook something. No does not lead. So what do the American people really want? What's missing on the map of America? Renewal. Are we that different from who we were not that long ago? No. Lift our eyes over the horizon. Take us to a better place. Show us that there's something better here. That's still who we are. How do we know this? Okay, Alex, nice map. <laughs> but how do we know this? Lots of ways. One, because Americans vote on this every day with what they buy. What are the great brands that Americans can't get enough of? You hunger for? Washington doesn't want to mess with them. Amazon, Apple, I heard an Apple. Amazon, Google. They're ascendant brands. They're brands that produce miraculous new things. Oh my God. I can do that. I can click and get. I didn't know I could do that. That's awesome. What are the brands people hate? Descendant brands, old brands, financial services, health care, energy. Why? They're over here. They used to be miraculous. The oil industry in the 50s powered an emergent American economy. It was so sexy they made movies about it. It was apple of its day. But what happens over time? These things over here that produce miraculous new benefits become familiar. The familiar becomes commonplace. What's commonplace has no value at all. Energy. Great, I got it in my car. Click on the light switch. It's always there. Why do those people make all that money? Who really needs them? It's always there. Healthcare, best in the world. Terrific. It's always there. Why do we need those people? This doesn't just happen to companies. It doesn't just happen to industries. It happens to countries. And it happens to political parties. And it's happened to the Republican Party. Why are we indispensably needed to help lead America to the future? That's the case we have to make. The good news is it ain't that hard to do. Why do Democrats, any Democrats in the room here? <laughs> Couple, admitted, confessed? <laughs> confessed Democrats? <laughs> many, many of them are nice people. <laughs> many are normal. <laughs> Wives, dogs, cats, you know, the whole shebang. From our Republican point of view, how can they be so amazingly and remarkably wrong about everything? <laughs> They're products of a time, products of a way of thinking, products of a great way of thinking, the industrial age, the world of Newton, first time science emerges upon the world and all of a sudden the world is Newton's clock, it's a machine, wind it up, we can understand the world that way. If the world is a machine, shouldn't we tweak it, make it work better? Don't we have a moral obligation? to do so? Imagine that you're there with Henry Ford. The day he says, hey guys, I got a great idea. See these car things? We don't have to make them one at a time. What a day that must have been. And look at the economy it produced. Industrial America. 5% of the world's people producing 25% of the world, world's wealth. What a remarkable idea. So what do you do if that's how you produce things, create things, tackle problems? That's how you model all problem solving, right? We create a big factory in Washington, top down, standardized conformity, and we crank out policies and programs. Any color you want as long as it's black, right? One minor problem with that way of thinking. 
We don't live in that world anymore. We don't live in that top-down factory world. Big, dumb, slow, centralized things are dying. What world do we live in? We live in a hyper-connected world. This is the computer age, the age of the internet. We're connected in ways we've never been before. We live in a world where that, the cogs and gears in, in Washington's factories, that would be you, by the way, the cogs and gears have learned to talk to each other, make decisions. The cogs and gears have learned to talk back, adapt. How can you run a factory when the cogs and gears move around all the time? Gee, no wonder big, dumb, slow, top-down Washington isn't really doing that great a job on anything. We have the biggest government in the world. What does it govern? Retirement? Well, actually, no. Social Security is kind of a Ponzi scheme. We all know it. We're running out of young people to pay for old people like me. You young people here better get to work. I'm going to be expensive. <laughs> they don't govern retirement. Do they govern education? Well, no. Actually, that big old factory school system, we're failing a generation of kids. They're dropping out of schools. They're going to be imprisoned either in real prisons or prisons of poverty. That's our gift to them. Do we govern education? No. Okay, how about uh, health care? How's that going this week? Big, dumb, slow, top down. They had three years to work on it, hundred billion, hundreds of millions of dollars. And you know the problem? This is not the worst they can do. This is the best they can do. Top down, Washington, factory, we, three guys in a room. It can't keep up with complex adaptive systems. If you'll go to newrepublican.org, there's a reading list, critical thinking. Folks at the Santa Fe Institute are telling us they understand the world differently than we used to. The world isn't a machine. The world isn't cogs and gears. That's not what we think of an economy. It's not what we think of life. Today we understand the world bottom up. We understand the world, it's emergent structures, self-organizing systems. Who plans on how to get groceries to New York City? The old answer used to be nobody. The new answer is no, everybody. It's bottom up. The lack of a big top-down factory to do it doesn't mean it's disorganized. In fact, as a matter of fact, when it's a complex system, an adaptive system, the only way you can organize it is bottom up. And in fact, life works that way. One brain cell can't think, many can. How does that happen? Cool. Complex adaptive systems can't be run. The more complex society gets, the more the big old factory in Washington struggles. We don't see ourselves as cogs and gears, but we still have the old factory style government. So if that's the way the world used to work, the factory, how do we understand the world we're moving into? Three ways. One, it's connected, right? Super connected. Things that are open are good. For example, you talk to kids today, and we as Republicans go up to them and go, big government, ooh. <laughs> and we think we're going to scare their pants off, right? And they go, huh? They don't think big is bad. Big is what they're connected to. The whole world is big. And they got it all right here. Big as Google. Big as democracy. Big as freedom. Big as choices. I want big. If big is bottom up and open and expands choices, big is good. If big is old and top down in the factory and limits choices, it's bad. The difference isn't big anymore. The difference is bottom up or top down. It's open. So one is our connectedness. Hey, that's the world we live in. I recognize that world. Two, we look at systems like economies, political systems, social systems, and we think they're not machines. 
they're more like living things because we all kind of interact. So we look at things that are organic and natural and we go, yeah, I understand the world that way. I don't have to tell voters that something that's natural and organic is kind of better than something that is machine-like. It's true to their life. That, they're pre-sold. As a matter of fact, you pay more for it at Whole Foods. It's good. Another way we understand the world is the world of rights. Someone a couple hundred years ago in this country had an idea, and that idea was, you're not a cog in a gear. You're a living thing, and you have value as a human being. Human rights, the idea that you as an American are empowered to determine your own future, make your own choices. Gee, that seems to have caught on around the world. So things that offer equal opportunity, things that are fair, things that respect your rights, things that are natural and organic, things that are open, are good things in the world we're moving into. So what does all that mean politically? It means that in some ways I could make you the argument that Republicans have been right all along. We used to call it the invisible hand. Well, now we can see it. Now we're moving into a world, this world, this hyper-connected, adaptive, organic world we're moving into, it can't succeed without freedom. The things that Republicans have believed are even more appropriate and essential for the world we're moving into than the world we're leaving. So, if that's the case, how do we win campaigns with it? How do we lead? Are Republican principles good now for more than saying no? Maybe. Let's have a debate. You're going to have one here in New Hampshire, tons of them, starting soon for the next election, right? Here's how that debate would go right now if Republicans remain the party of no. It'd go like this. The Democrat would stand up and say, our economy sucks. Thank God I'm here. I have got a new idea. I'm going to create a new government program. And I'm going to tax this Griffin guy because clearly he has not been paying his fair share. And I'm going to take that money. I'm going to create a new program. And it's going to work great, awesome, unbelievably well this time, maybe, because even though it actually never has before. But what the heck, I'm trying. And my Republican opponent over here, all he can do is say no. He doesn't have anything better to say. And then he'd sit down and the Republican would stand up and the Republican will stand up and say, that's right, and sit down. Because that's kind of where we are right now, right? We're kind of busy saying no. That's all we think we have to offer. But what if a Republican remembers that the ideas of freedom, of openness, of natural and organic growth, of, of equal opportunity that we believe in, what if we remember that those aren't old ideas that sit on a shelf somewhere? But that's the world we're moving into. So what if the Republican gets up and gives a different response and says something like this? Mr. Democrat, I'm glad you want to grow the economy. I do too. I just have one question for you. Why do you want to do it the old way? The old way? What do you mean the old way? I'm a Democrat. I've got a new program. No, no. Why do you want to do it the old way? Why do you want to try to grow the economy top down, politically and artificially from Washington? It hasn't worked for decades. Why don't we try something fresh? A Republican saying fresh? New? What? Why don't we try something fresh? Why don't we try growing the economy naturally and organically, bottom up, instead of top down politically and artificially from Washington? The next generation of voters says, what? Natural? Natural's good. I like natural. Bottom up, that's good. Yeah. Why don't we take the seeds of growth, plant the seeds of growth, nice organic metaphor there. Why don't we plant the seeds of growth in the fertile soil of your economy? Mr. Voter, where you live, where you work, where you save, instead of the barren concrete of Washington, nothing grows there. Natural, organic, economic growth. One, it's a heck of a lot better than no. 
two, it's reflective of the world we're moving into. And the Democrat argument for growth is what? More of the same? Of the past? Another issue that'll work along the same lines. There are two great parents in Washington. I'm dying for a Republican to tell a story like this. There are two great parents in Washington. They chose the best school in town for their two beautiful daughters. Isn't that great? Michelle and Barack Obama. We may disagree on some issues, but we all know they're good parents. Now, what about you? Shouldn't every parent have equal opportunity to take their kids, give them the best, the best school possible? Shouldn't every parent have equal opportunity to choose the best school for their kids? Shouldn't every child have equal opportunity to reach their educational potential? How hard is it? All we have to do is let the money follow the child instead of the child follow the money. It's not complicated. Equal opportunity. I'd love to see Republicans going into the inner city, into the barrio, in front of the NAACP and saying, you know what? This country has never had more economic progress, possibility and potential. But unless all our kids make it, none of our kids will. We got a world to challenge here. And your kids need to succeed. All our kids do. There's one kid, these kids dropping out of school, one of them might have had the next great idea. One of them might have had the next great invention, the next great iPhone. One of them might have had the next incredible success, maybe the most important success of all, the next great family. And we don't know which kid it is. So we better save them all. Equal opportunity in education. That's what Republicans believe in. We not only win a survey question, we transform how the Republican brand is perceived. It's a heck of a lot better than no. And here's the good news for Republicans. It works on everything. Because it is true and descriptive about the future we're moving into. The future we're moving into does need things that are open and bottom up and organic and respect equal opportunity and human rights. Do you want a closed health care system? Do you want a top down health care system where decisions are made politically and artificially? Perhaps at the most important moment of your life? Or do you want an open health care system, a bottom up health care system where decisions are made by you and your doctor? Guess what Americans will choose? Will they choose an open energy system or a closed one? Republicans have a better story to tell, and that's what we're trying to do at newrepublican.org. Newrepublican.org, yes, I'll remember that, okay. That's what we're trying to do at newrepublican.org, is plant the seeds that uh, for our party for the next generation, saying that our principles are good for more than saying no. The choice we're being given now as Republicans is either keep talking about your principles the way you do now and lose, or sell out your principles, become Democrats light and lose. Neither of those seems acceptable to me. If, and they don't have to be, if we as Republicans understand, come to understand, that the freedom, that the bottom up, that the open society that we have always advocated is essential for all of us to reach the potential and the promise that the new world we're moving into offers us. So with that, we can talk some questions. I know there will be some doubters and naysayers about this new Republican Party that I think is, I hope is just over the horizon. We have a crop of, uh, you know, nothing new grows under the shade of a big tree. We had George Bush for eight years and it stunted a generation of Republican growth. No new candidates. The big tree is gone now. We're seeing a new generation of Republicans step up. What we're trying to do is offer them a positive direction, something to say. 
something to believe in that doesn't require them to compromise what they believe. Instead, it requires us to take it into the future. Ronald Reagan could have echoed Goldwater. He could have repeated Goldwater. He could have said, anti-big government, anti-communism. He didn't didn't abandon it, he built on it. He said, in addition to that, we have a rendezvous with destiny, that up arrow. What Reagan did for his party in his time, it is our job to do for our party in our time. And that is explain how our principles fit a new world. So that's what we're about. Questions? You political animals, you. <laughs> this is like being at the Disneyland of politics, you know. This is where, where it all happens. All right, well, here's a question I'm often asked. Yes, question. Oh, or, unless you <laughs> You fire away. Oversaturated. Well, as someone whose job it has been to buy this media that oversaturates people, absolutely not. <laughs> um, trends. Yeah, a lot. I mean, the big change is from top down to bottom up. Campaigns used to be one direction. We're going to infect your, chew your food for you and pour it in your eyes and ears. Uh, that world has changed. Uh, we are now in a bottom up campaign world. It's about community building. Uh, Campaigns are a thing of the past. Campaigns now get beaten by causes, by self-organizing, by bottom-up organizing and connectedness. And if you can't create a cause, you'll get beat. And technology, that connectedness, empowers you to do that. What's the difference between a campaign and a cause? A cause has a purpose, gives you a purpose greater than yourself. A cause is Americans' hunger to believe in something greater than themselves. There's a great book I'd recommend called Instincts of the Herd in Peace and War, written by Wilfred Trotter in 1908, Amazon, Kindle. Um, 1908. And in a nutshell, the book is this. Once upon a time, there's one animal, us. We're alone. Self-preservation was the imperative. Then we met another animal, two animals, thus the herd. And when we met and joined up, guess what? The odds improved. And what became the imperative? Not self-preservation, the success and survival of the herd. We're social animals. Being part of something advanced our odds. We hunger to be part of something. Out of the blackness we come, into the blackness eventually we go. While we're here, what gives our life meaning and purpose? We want to belong to something. We're now connected in ways we have never been to belong to that something. That's what technology allows. Americans will do remarkable things for a purpose greater than themselves. A young guy will jump on a grenade for his buddies when you would think it makes no sense at all. But that's who we are. And the most valuable thing you can do for a voter is not campaign at him, but ask him to share in something that has a large purpose. That's what I think the promise of this technology is that we have. There's a dark side. The dark side, we were just, Jim, we were just talking about it, that. Um, Social media also lets you attract a lot of eyeballs for the more outrageous and divisive you are. And so we see this fractured politics that we have now where the people in Washington never get to take off their jerseys, they're always connected to the audience back home. And again, the more divisive you are, the more eyeballs you draw. So it, the world has changed. Yes, sir. 
I'm going to try and speak in two questions. Okay. Um, first one is, I'm, I'm a college professor. I teach political science. And I, I, see, I see a lot of young people who really feel no connection uh, to government, feel no connection to folks who would have their vote. And I wonder, you've talked a little bit about this, but I wonder if you would give us your thoughts on how candidates might better, uh, more authentically, speak to young people as a, as a demographic. And the second is, in your, in your schematic, you identified, um, I think, a, a really interesting way of, of looking at things. And so it seems to me there is a very clear message for Republicans that you've articulated. And so now I'm going to ask you to look to 2016 and identify who that messenger might be. For me, growing up in, in the Reagan years, Ronald Reagan spoke to me as a young person. Um, is there someone like him out there on the horizon um, that, that might be able to attract uh, people to, to the Republican brand again? Well, one of the problems with New Republicans is we don't have any yet. <laughs> well, we're working on it. Uh, yeah, there's a new crop out there. Um, you know, Jeb Bush is out there. And despite an old brand name, he's a very different kind of Republican. He is that optimistic guy. Um, that uh, in the old Reagan story, there's got to be a pony in there somewhere. That's Jeb. There's a Bobby Jindal who completely gets th this kind of thing. He knows the problem with Washington is, it's not that it has bad intentions. The problem is it's got good intentions. It's trying really hard and can't do anything. It's old. Uh, there's, um, who gets this? Uh, a lot of folks, we'll see on the presidential level, the dark side is that we may be about to go through what we went through in 2010, which is we succeed by saying no. Washington's out of control again, just like it was in 2010. The NSA, the IRS, snooping on reporters, Obamacare, ah, what are those people doing? Republicans may succeed the wrong way once again and learn the wrong lesson for 2016. So is that candidate, and your first question was, Young people, how do we inspire them? I think you have to explain, first of all, they're the most empowered, you who teach them, and the rest of us here who on occasion try to employ them. We know they're the most independent generation of Americans we've ever seen. They don't want to be told what to do by anybody. They have just elected the biggest, old, top-down, tell them what to do, conformity enforcing, type of thinking you've ever seen. Barack Obama was a very different candidate than he has been a president. As a, as a candidate, he was, we're the change we've been waiting for. As a president, he's been George McGovern without the experience. Classic top-down, classic top-down. There isn't a new idea in the Obama administration at all. It's more of the same. So how do you go to those young kids? You speak to them in their language. You talk about an open world instead of a closed one. You talk about an organic solution and natural solutions as opposed to political and artificial ones. You talk about equal opportunity and human rights and fairness. Now that does compel certain changes in the Republican Party. One of them is our conflict between libertarians and social conservatives. How do we wrestle that bear to the ground? A lot of these young people are turned off because the people who say they advocate freedom also want less of it. That's kind of a problem, guys. We need to fix that. We can't be the party that says it advocates freedom, but when it, on education, on health care, on the economy, but then advocate less of it on social issues. Is there a path forward for the Republican Party there? Yes, there is. I'll recommend another book by Kevin Miller, and it's called Freedom Nationally, Virtue Locally. And I think that's a great slogan for the next Republican Party. No one has to give up their values. No one has to change what they believe about life or marriage in the Republican Party. But can we all agree on this? It's not Washington's job. The factory can't do a good job on the economy, on education, on health care. How, how can we imagine it could do a better job as the moral enforcer charged with transmitting our values and our culture to the next generation? It ain't doing so good. If you really want a virtuous society, a moral society, it's not Washington's job, it's yours. 
that's a job that belongs in our churches, in our communities, in our families. The Catholic principle of subsidiarity pushed the problem down, pushed the solution down to where the problem is. It used to be called federalism. It used to be called localism. Now it's bottom up and natural and organic. But we need to be that same party. And by the way, that's where the energy in the Republican Party is, especially with young people. Among where? Rand Paul. And if we don't get there, our party might split. And that would be a bad thing. Yes, sir. Alex, I want to ask you about, uh, you'll know what I mean. Uh, how does John Boehner get out of what he's in right now successfully? Gets his toe around the trigger of the shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's a, I think there's a path out. I think there's a path out here. I think we all understand. You know, there may have been times we screwed around with the debt limit before. That ain't today. Today, we're at a much more dangerous place. It's one thing when government isn't central to the global economic system. It is right now, and everybody knows it. And Boehner knows that. I think at the end of the day, what happens, the party that is the part of the Republican Party the 20 percent, the 30 to 40 congressmen who want to fight and die on this hill, they've kind of won. They've gotten what they want. And politically, they'll actually be happy if Boehner folds. If Boehner opens up the vote to Democrats and Republicans and they pass a clean CR and get the debt limit thing resolved, they lose the, the process, but that's a win politically for them. It vindicates them. See, you need us more than ever. Ted Cruz just did that, and it was a huge political win for him. So Boehner, I think, can open it up, and I don't think the pressure then will be to replace Boehner. I think that 20% of the Republican Party is very happy having a more malleable speaker. It empowers them. So that's how I think ultimately this thing is resolved. Which, by the way, is an interesting thing to note. Yes, the Republican Party is divided. Yes, we have a 30 or 40 congressmen here who are in safe districts, who do not worry about a general election, who do worry about someone getting to their right in a primary. So they're not really worried about the mainstream. The Republican Party is divided and will not compromise. Great. Look at the Democratic Party. They have congressmen in safe districts. How come they're not worried about anyone getting on their left? Because they can't. The entire Democratic Party is on the left. All the blue dog Democrats were kicked out last time when the Republicans took 60 seats. This isn't Hillary Clinton's new Democratic Party. This is Elizabeth Warren's Democratic Party. This is Howard Dean's Democratic Party. This is Bill de Blasio's Democratic Party. Hillary Clinton's going to have, no, they're not divided. Imagine where that's going to leave a Democratic Party after Barack Obama is gone. A Democratic Party that has moved left of Clinton, a Democratic Party that is energized and empowered by social activism and digital media, holy smoke, we are going to see one fun fist fight over here, guys. This is going to be awesome. Buy tickets to New Hampshire now, because this is going to be great. I think Hillary's going to have a very hard time holding the Democratic Party together. You know, her one card that connects her to the up arrow in the future is we've never had a female president. Yeah, Elizabeth Warren thinks so, too. Who else got a question? Got a question, got a question. Yes, sir. Can you say something about the emergence of the permanent campaign in the last presidential election cycle, the use of analytics on a very connected basis to identify everything not on a broad American issue, but on a basis of a very personal cause basis, so that at the end of the day, we're all just a highly divided, parceled out, analyzed. Oh, my God, yeah. it's. I am so glad I'm retired from 
from uh, active campaigning these days. I'm, I'm pro promoted myself to senior advisor. My motto is occasionally responsive, never responsible. <laughs> and, and the reason is because it's gotten really hard. It's gotten really hard. You know, no longer can I go crack open a can of TV spots and shoot them down to voters and okay, that's a campaign. No, not anymore. You know, it is an organism. Now, campaigns are living things. There is no survey anymore. Get on Twitter. It's an ongoing survey. All the time, real time, right there. All the social media is. All that data that's out there. You know, it's not the old snapshot way we used to look at campaigns. That doesn't exist anymore. And what all campaigns are hungry for is is that kind of in-depth big data analysis. I'll tell you a story. There's a great restaurant in Old Town Alexandria, Landini Brothers. I highly recommend. Uh, the owner, Franco Landini, was talking to one of the waiters who worked there. A Hispanic guy had been with him for 20 years. American citizen. The uh, Franco goes, after the election, Franco was shocked that, that uh, Romney lost so badly. Ask his, uh, ask his employee, the waiter, were you ever contacted by the Romney campaign? The guy goes, zero. And I knew it, I knew it. Were you ever contacted by the Obama campaign? The guy goes, oh yeah. Frank says, oh, I knew it. At least two or three times, right? The guy goes, oh no. Over the past year, 40. 40 times, and it wasn't top down from some phone bank somewhere. It was by his neighbors. It was by people in his church. It was in the people in the barber shop down the street. They had files on each other. This is the wiki campaign. They campaigned, they got the world campaigning at each other. Very different structure than, uh, than we've seen in politics before. And, um, but that's where we're all headed. You know, it's going to be really hard now that the NSA has lost all our information on that. But, uh, <laughs> guys, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. This is where, you know, it's still where it all starts for me. This is the most fun, uh, you know, and this is the most independent country on the planet. You don't tell Americans what to do. They get in their Jeep Cherokees and go places and do things. And the most independent state in the most independent country, the, the emblem of that is, is New Hampshire. Live free or vote Democrat. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to be here.